Hello and welcome to Health Affairs This Week. I'm your host, Jeff Byers. Uh, Before we get into today's episode, I wanted to give everyone a quick reminder that Health Affairs is now reviewing abstract submissions for a theme issue on food, nutrition, and health. The issue aims to provide evidence on policy interventions at the intersection of food, nutrition, and health. Check the show notes to learn more about submitting abstracts and the issue, and submit your abstract by end of day, July 29th. Today, we have on the program Andrew Twinamasico. Andrew is the Director of Health Policy and the Law Initiative at the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law at Georgetown Law. Andrew, welcome to the program. Thank you. I really appreciate you taking that mouthful of a name and like really succinctly telling our listeners who who I am and where I come from. Today, we're here to talk about the Chevron Doctrine. Now, the Chevron Doctrine is something that I honestly wasn't too familiar with until Andrew, you and I started working together on the um, Health Affairs Insider program, where you and colleagues, Zachary Barron and Sheila Ranganathan, you all three author uh, Insider Newsletter on Health Reform. Uh, One of the first things you wrote about was the Chevron Doctrine or a portion of it. And so after I learned that from your newsletter, and if you're not, if listener, you're not a Health Affairs Insider, be sure to become a Health Affairs Insider to be able to read these. I had that, the Bader-Meinhof phenomenon where I then I just started noticing other publications referring to the Chevron Doctrine quite a bit, Uh, you know, kind of like how when we're forced to learn what NFTs or generative AI is supposed to do for whatever. So I thought you'd be a great person to like explain to us what the Chevron Doctrine is and what it means for healthcare. So like at a very, very high level with all that set up, what did the Chevron Doctrine do? Yeah. Okay. Well, great. Thank you for having me again. So Chevron deference derives its name from a Supreme Court case that was decided back in 1984, actually, Chevron USA versus National Resource Defense Council. In that case, um, the court established what is typically referred to as a two-step framework to guide the courts in determining the validity of regulatory actions taken by administrative agencies. So under that framework, when a regulation is challenged, The first step a reviewing court must take is to determine whether Congress has spoken directly on the issue. And if Congress has spoken directly on the issue, then courts are supposed to abide by Congress's clear directive. But if the statute is is ambiguous, we go to step two. That's when the second step comes in. If the statute is ambiguous, then the courts must defer to an agency's reasonable interpretation of that statute if that interpretation is reasonable. So that's where the the idea of deference comes from. You defer to an agency's interpretation of a statute if that interpretation is reasonable. And I I, I think to situate this doctrine, I really want to take a step back and explain what um, the the, the justifications for it. The first is, of course, the practical understanding of how the legislative process works. The court understood that Congress seldom has the expertise to determine the precise policy interventions that may be needed to address a specific issue. So instead of trying to figure out every solution to every conceivable problem, what Congress typically does is to legislate broadly, knowing that they are experts in the field, such as, you know, the EPA, the FDA, the CDC, And those agencies working within um, specific legislative frameworks, they may leverage their expertise and work nimbly to respond to certain trends, you know, changing technologies, health emergencies, say, for example, COVID-19. So within that framework, agencies are able to respond, but also abiding by the spirit of the statute and doing their job. The other justification is actually rooted in democratic principles of representative government and judicial humility. The idea is that Article Three judges, federal judges, aren't really elected. Uh, they get lifetime appointment and they're not experts either. They are just generalists who are trained in the law. And so Chevron recognized that instead of 
having these lay judges step in and second guess the career of the work of career experts. They let the experts do the work and courts come in only when the experts get it clearly wrong. And so, you know, of course, this is democratic in a sense because agencies exist within the executive branch, which is headed by an elected president. And so there's all those ideas of policy considerations and democratic principles that undergird the uh, Chevron deference. Well, with the example of COVID-19, because, yeah, my immediate thought was like, what's a healthcare example? And then you shared COVID-19, which I think really fits nicely into it. And so the question I had is like, there has been some changes with the Chevron doctrine, uh, to say the least. Can you, within the Supreme Court, like what what happened? Well, I mean, Chevron is no more. It was right, right. <laughs> it was interred. Say the least. <laughs> yeah, it was interred at the end of the court's term before the court took off for the summer. And so, no, Chevron is no more. Uh, the Supreme Court decided two cases, Lopa Bright and Relentless Inc., both of which involved a challenge to a National Marine Fisheries Service rule that required that fishing boats that are re- regulated. Uh, fishing boats that operate in the Atlantic, uh, specifically herring fishing boats, carry and pay for third-party monitors when federal funds fall short. And, of course, the fishing boat businesses weren't really happy about the rule because they they had to eat, eat in their profits. But these monitors are really central to ensuring that there's no overfishing and, con- and, and the conservation of, um, of fishing resources. And so they sued cl- challenging the rule and the courts, the lower courts lo- looking at the statute, they, were, they said, well, this is a reasonable interpretation of the statute. And so they upheld the rule. But the court, this, when, this, uh, when the, court, the case eventually got to the Supreme Court, The Supreme Court said, no, this is an abdication of your mandate. You are supposed to really look at the statute yourself and not defer to how an agency would interpret the agency's interpretation of the rule. And really, those two cases uh, were a culmination of a long year's campaign by the uh, Supreme Court against the Chevron doctrine. Uh, The court itself mentioned that it hasn't applied Chevron since 2016. So Chevron is no more. Yeah. And how long was it around? Uh, Chevron was decided in 1984. So for 40 years, that's how we've we've operated under Chevron. And now it's gone. What does this mean from a policy standpoint? Like, obviously, there's like, I want to know about some healthcare examples, but just in general, like, what are the implications of this decision? Well, I mean, from a policy standpoint, the overruling Chevron means a lot. And I kind of laid out the justifications for it, but I'll go into a little bit because it undercuts those justifications that I that I already alluded to. So broadly, this is a huge judicial power grab. It really curtails how members of the elected branches of government do their job. First, the court has now aggrandized itself as the ultimate decision maker, even on like policy disputes and technical, technical disputes to second guess what members of the career experts in the executive decide about different, you know, how to implement uh, congressional directives. Second, it also hampers how Congress may go about doing its job. So even before Chevron was decided 40 years ago, Congress had always legislated against a background on which Chevron was premised, that when Congress legislates broadly and tasks agencies to implement uh, its legislation, everything should be okay as long as agencies don't unreasonably miss the mark. But now that Chevron is gone, that means that Congress will not only have to figure out how to hammer out legislative details that hardly leave leave any wiggle room, it also means that existing regulations interpreting and implementing the existing statutes will be vulnerable to attacks. So it really opens up a lot of things to challenge in court. And for agencies, it will have a huge chilling effect on what they can do. You know, as I previously mentioned, agencies have operated with an understanding that their regulations are going to be respected if they're reasonable. 
And this hasn't uh, meant that agents will do anything with really the expecting the courts will rubber stamp what they do. I mean, anyone who's familiar with regulatory rulemaking knows the rigors through which agencies go through uh, to adopt and finalize a rule. But now with Chevron gone, that means that even the assurance that agencies had to adopt rules going forward will be chilled in a way because they'll know that anybody can go to court and and say, hey, I, I do disagree with what the court did, uh, with what the agency did, and I want my day in court. So with these implications, um, is there anything from a healthcare perspective that you could give an example of how this could play out, you know, the end of Chevron? Yeah, no. And I think really it's hard to give one specific example because, like I said, it's going to unleash uh, floodgates of litigation. But yeah, lawyers already, are excited. Yeah, but we're already seeing this playing out in the courts. Uh, an example came out last week. So what comes to mind is the ACA's non-discrimination protections under Section 1557. That provision, it incorporates civil rights protections in health programs and activities. And one of those protections is against sex-based discrimination. Four years ago, the Supreme Court in Bostock v. Clayton County ruled that sex-based discrimination under Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which prohibits discrimination in employment, the court said it was broad enough to encompass sexual orientation and gender identity. Well, great, right? (laughs) And the HHS was like, well, since that's the Supreme Court's interpretation, we'll adopt it to the extent that the similar protection applies to health programs and activities. Great, right? (laughs) Yeah, no, not so fast. Just last week, a federal district court in Mississippi, yeah, cue that Nina Simone, Mississippi, goddamn, (laughs) it literally cited Loper Bright and ruled that HHS could not adopt that interpretation, even though the Supreme Court has said, you know, sex-based discrimination includes sexual orientation and gender identity. So even though the court has moved and said, and embrace this capacious interpretation of discrimination. The courts are now saying, well, you, you're not entitled to even use that reasonable interpretation to apply it to this statute, which you're interested in implementing. So that's really like a case of how even narrow the courts are going to scrutinize agency actions. As you were discussing that, and you were talking about how the judges haven't used Chevron since 2016, Is there any reason that you know of of why this doctrine was so loathed by these officials? Well, it's really interesting because that that actually puts the idea of Chevron in a bigger context of the anti-administrative posture that the court has had, depending on the politics of who is in charge of the executive. Now, when Chevron was initially adopted, it was actually anti, uh, it was it was a deregulatory tool. It was a gift of the Supreme Court to the Reagan administration, and the EPA had used it to cut back on how um, uh, stationary sources can be regulated. And there's actually a lot of writing on, on empirical studies that have shown how the Supreme Court's use of the Chevron doctrine, the pendulum swings depending on who the, the politics of the executive. If they don't like the politics, they will not apply Chevron. If they like the politics, they will apply Chevron. So it really depends on how it is. So it just seems like right now Chevron wasn't really working for the conservative supermajority and they decided they were done with it. Um, So Chevron is no more. And, you know, typically I want to ask, like, is there anything we should, you know, know or watch in this space? Um, In the absence of something, it's kind of it's kind of hard to say that. But like, what should people interested in health policy and and politics for this be watching going forward? Well, I mean, I think it's really good to to put the end of Chevron in context. In the last few years, we've seen how the court has deployed new doctrines to cut back on health measures. Think about uh, measures to mitigate COVID-19 from CDC's eviction moratorium, from OSHA's um, vaccine or test standard and from EPA's regulation of greenhouse emissions. And the court saying, well, Congress didn't speak clearly enough. And so you don't have the authority to do these things. 
And so that's one thing, the, the major questions doctrine. And now we have a doctrine that has been in place for 40 years. The court is also cutting back on that, on like what deference agencies can have when, they, when Congress has spoken. So one, on one hand, Congress hasn't clearly spoken for you to adopt COVID mitigation measures. In case where Congress has spoken, no, we're not going to defer to your interpretation. We know better. And one thing to really put kind of a, a bow on this is um, at the end of the term as well, the court decided another case, and listeners should look out for it, uh, Corner Post v. Federal Reserve. That case opens up the statute of limitations in which to challenge federal regulations. So there is a a six-year statute of limitations to challenge a a federal regulation. But the court recalibrated how that statute of limitation is interpreted and said that you actually don't, you can uh, challenge that beyond the six-year period as long as your cause of action accrues within six years. So you don't really have to wait. You you can just, so this really gives, opens up the length of time going back to even age uh, regulations have been here for, for a decade. And I think that to understand, like to understand that implicate the implications of that, look at the case uh, involving abortion medication, which was kicked out partly because they were out of time. The challenges were out of time because abortion medication had been on the market for over 20 years. And now folks can go back and say, our injury accrued actually within the last six years, not within the, not, not in, in 2006, within six years when it was first approved. And so think about what that means for coupled with end of Chevron. And so we are going to see what um, Justice Jackson called a tsunami of litigation challenging federal regulations. So in your view, is there anything positive that you can take away from this? I mean, I, I, I think it's too early to tell, but the prospects are not great, especially for agencies in health. I mean, I think it's really important because this is where the science is. There is there's been a huge shift nationally that is anti-science, anti-fact. And I think there's an attack on the scientific expertise of agencies that are entrusted with, a, with protecting our health. So I don't think that prospects are really great. But I mean, there's people soldier on. So we'll see what, what, how to play this hand that we've been dealt by the Supreme Court. Yeah, I had to ask, hoping, hoping we could end on something good, but Maybe that was wishful thinking on, on my own part, but oh, I could Andrew, be wrong. I, I could be wrong, but um, I, <laughs> I'm not seeing any good prospects. Well, like any good research paper uh, ends on more information is needed, and time will tell. So, Andrew Tonomasiko, thank you for joining us today on Health Affairs this week. And uh, listener, hope you enjoyed this episode. Send this to the lawyer in your life. And hope you join us next week. Thanks all. Bye.